episode 30. Here it is, said Hermione excitedly as she found the page headed the Polyjuice Potion. It was decorated with drawings of people halfway through transforming into other people. Harry sincerely hoped the artist had imagined the looks of intense pain on their faces. This is the most complicated potion I've ever seen, said Hermione as they scanned the recipe. Lacewing flies, leeches, fluxweed, and not grass, she murmured, running her finger down the list of ingredients. Well, they're easy enough. They're in the student store cupboard. We can help ourselves. Oh, look, powdered horn of a bicorn. Don't know where we're going to get that. Shredded skin of a boom slang? That'll be tricky, too. And, of course, a bit of whoever we want to change into. Excuse me? said Ron sharply. What do you mean a bit of whoever we're changing into? I'm drinking nothing with crab's toenails in it. Hermione continued as though she hadn't heard him. We don't have to worry about that yet, though, because we add those bits last. Ron turned, speechless, to Harry, who had another worry. Do you realize how much we're going to have to steal, Hermione? Shredded skin of a boom slang, that's definitely not in the student's cupboard. What are we going to do, break into Snape's private stores? I don't know if this is a good idea. Hermione shut the book with a snap. Well, if you two are going to chicken out, fine, she said. There were bright pink patches on her cheeks, and her eyes were brighter than usual. I don't want to break the rules, you know. I think threatening Muggleborns is far worse than brewing up a difficult potion. But if you don't want to find out if it's Malfoy, I'll go straight to Madame Pince now and hand the book back in. I never thought I'd see the day when you'd be persuading us to break rules, said Ron. All right, we'll do it. But not toenails, okay? How long will it take to make anyway, said Harry, as Hermione, looking happier, opened the book again. Well... Since the flux weed has got to be picked at the full moon and the lace wings have got to be stewed for 21 days, I'd say it'll be ready in about a month, if we can get all the ingredients. A month, said Ron. Malfoy could have attacked half the muggle-borns in school by then. But Hermione's eyes narrowed dangerously again, and he added swiftly, but it's the best plan we've got, so full steam ahead, I say. However... While Hermione was checking that the coast was clear for them to leave the bathroom, Ron muttered to Harry, It'll be a lot less hassle if you can just knock Malfoy off his broom tomorrow. Harry woke early on Saturday morning and lay for a while thinking about the coming Quidditch match. He was nervous, mainly at the thought of what Wood would say if Gryffindor lost, but also at the idea of facing a team mounted on the fastest racing brooms gold could buy. He had never wanted to beat Slytherin so badly. After half an hour of lying there with his insides churning, he got up, dressed, and went down to breakfast early, where he found the rest of the Gryffindor team huddled at the long, empty table, all looking uptight and not speaking much. As eleven o'clock approached, the whole school started to make its way down to the Quidditch Stadium. It was a muggy sort of day, with a hint of thunder in the air. Ron and Hermione came hurrying over to wish Harry good luck as he entered the locker rooms. The team pulled on their scarlet Gryffindor robes, then sat down to listen to Wood's usual pre-match pep talk. Slytherin has better brooms than us, he began, no point denying it, but we've got better people on our brooms. We've trained harder than they have. We've been flying in all weathers. Too true, muttered George Weasley. I haven't been properly dry since August. And we're going to make them rue the day they let that little bit of slime Malfoy buy his way onto their team. Chest heaving with emotion, Wood turned to Harry. It'll be down to you, Harry, to show them that a seeker has to have something more than a rich father. 
Get to that snitch before Malfoy or die trying, Harry, because we've got to win today. We've got to. So, no pressure, Harry, said Fred, winking at him. As they walked out onto the pitch, a roar of noise greeted them, mainly cheers, because Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff were anxious to see Slytherin beaten. But the Slytherins in the crowd made their boos and hisses heard, too. Madame Hooch, the Quidditch teacher, asked Flint and Wood to shake hands, which they did, giving each other threatening stares and gripping rather harder than was necessary. On my whistle, said Madame Hooch. Three, two, one. With a roar from the crowd to speed them upward, the fourteen players rose toward the leaden sky. Harry flew higher than any of them, squinting around for the snitch. All right there, Skyhead, yelled Malfoy, shooting underneath him as though to show off the speed of his broom. Harry had no time to reply. At that very moment, a heavy black bludger came pelting toward him. He avoided it so narrowly that he felt it ruffle his hair as it passed. Close one, Harry, said George, streaking past him with his club in his hand, ready to knock the bludger back toward a Slytherin. Harry saw George give the bludger a powerful whack in the direction of Adrian Pusey. But the bludger changed direction in mid-air and shot straight for Harry again. Harry dropped quickly to avoid it, and George managed to hit it hard toward Malfoy. Once again, the bludger swerved like a boomerang and shot at Harry's head. Harry put on a burst of speed and zoomed toward the other end of the pitch. He could hear the bludger whistling along behind him. What was going on? Bludgers never concentrated on one player like this. It was their job to try to unseat as many people as possible. Fred Weasley was waiting for the bludger at the other end. Harry ducked as Fred swung at the bludger with all his might. The bludger was knocked off course. Gotcha, Fred yelled happily. But he was wrong. As though it was magnetically attracted to Harry, the bludger pelted after him once more, and Harry was forced to fly off at full speed. It had started to rain. Harry felt heavy drops fall onto his face, splattering onto his glasses. He didn't have a clue what was going on in the rest of the game until he heard Lee Jordan, who was commentating, say, Slytherin lead, 60 points to zero. The Slytherin's superior brooms were clearly doing their jobs. And meanwhile, the mad bludger was doing all it could to knock Harry out of the air. Fred and George were now flying so close to him on either side that Harry could see nothing at all except their flailing arms and had no chance to look for the snitch, let alone catch it. Someone's tampered with this bludger, Fred grunted, swinging his bat with all his might at it as it launched a new attack on Harry. We need time out, said George, trying to signal Wood and stop the bludger breaking Harry's nose at the same time. Wood had obviously got the message. Madame Hooch's whistle rang out, and Harry, Fred, and George dived for the ground, still trying to avoid the mad bludger. What's going on, said Wood, as the Gryffindor team huddled together, while Slytherins in the crowd jeered. We're being flattened, Fred. George, where were you when the bludger stopped Angelina scoring? We were twenty feet above her, stopping the other bludger from murdering Harry, Oliver, said George angrily. Someone's fixed it. It won't leave Harry alone. It hasn't gone for anyone else all game. The Slytherins must have done something to it. But the bludgers have been locked in Madame Hooch's office since our last practice, and there was nothing wrong with them then, said Wood anxiously. Madame Hooch was walking toward them. Over her shoulder, Harry could see the Slytherin team jeering and pointing in his direction. Listen, 
said Harry as she came nearer and nearer. With you two flying around me all the time, the only way I'm going to catch the snitch is if it flies up my sleeve. Go back to the rest of the team and let me deal with the rogue one. Don't be thick, said Fred. It'll take your head off. Wood was looking from Harry to the Weasleys. Oi, Oliver, this is insane, said Alicia Spinner angrily. You can't let Harry deal with that thing on his own. Let's ask for an inquiry. If we stop now, we'll have to forfeit the match, said Harry, and we're not losing to Slytherin just because of a crazy bludger. Come on, Oliver, tell them to leave me alone. This is all your fault, George said angrily to Wood. Get the snitch or die trying. What a stupid thing to tell him. Madame Hooch had joined them. Ready to resume play? she asked Wood. Wood looked at the determined look on Harry's face. All right, he said. Fred, George, you heard Harry. Leave him alone and let him deal with the bludger on his own. 